Patrick giving us some. Um, welcome to, uh, this is our 50th year of the Hale Speaker Series. We did take two years off because, well, we thought it was COVID. Yeah. <laughs> we, we won't do this. Um, so it's a long time that we've been having speakers come. And uh, it is amazing, uh, I'm not sure how many people know, but to be invited to be a speaker, you have to have a relationship to Westfield. So Timothy Rubb, his relationship was he grew up in Westfield and graduated from Westfield High School. So um, I can tell you one thing about Timothy. I can tell you a lot, but one thing I want to tell you is how humble he is. Because when I talked to him about an introduction, he pushed back pretty hard. I just, just say welcome. <laughs> and I pushed a little harder saying, oh, you know, you've done so much. No, just say welcome and that I've come down from the New Hampshire. Um, so I tried to follow your instructions, Timothy, not say anything but welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Barbara. Can you can you hear me in the back okay? Okay, how's that? Thank you. So in response to that welcome, I will say that I'm delighted to be here and, and back again. Uh, I got close to, to Westfield once again two years ago uh, when I attended our belated 50th high school reunion, two years after the fact, um, <clears throat> in, in Scotch Plains at Shackamax and Country Club. But I haven't been back to Westfield and downtown for the longest time. In fact, I didn't know that the library was here and not there, <laughs> which of course dates me. Now, Barbara and I spoke about this, her introduction on Monday night. I said I'd call her at six, but I, at that point I was still on the road in a long line of cars coming back from northern New Hampshire. So we drove up to the center of the, of the path of totality to take <clears throat> a look at the the total eclipse, which you see on the screen here. This a drone image taken from by a friend from Plainfield. And then here a picture um, that we we took a close up um, up near Burke Mountain in the, the Northeast Kingdom. It was extraordinary. Okay. Well, obviously this talk is not about astronomy. <laughs> and we pretty much exhausted my knowledge of that subject, so. <laughs> Um, let me begin by echoing what Barbara said, and that is, I grew up here. Um, my family uh, were one of the many um, New, um, New Yorkers who left the city in the late 50s. Um, they landed here and very happily and um, in 1957. So I can say I really did grow up here. Um, <coughs> I, a graduate of Lincoln Elementary School I don't know whether it's ever still in business. I hope it's not because it was the closest um, thing to a prison prison I've ever experienced um, in in education. And that's not to say it wasn't a good good school with very interesting teachers. It was. It was just a really horrible example of of educational architecture. And then um, Edison High School, which was as we were discussing before, right in my backyard. Uh, we lived on the south side, and our street um, butted up against the, um, the fields behind Edison High School. So I could quite literally, as I confessed um, a few minutes ago, um, roll out of bed and, and go to class. Uh, and I often did. And then finally to Westfield High School, from which I graduated in 1970. <clears throat> and that pretty much uh, finished our relationship with Westfield, because two years later, after our youngest our, my youngest sister graduated from high school. My parents decamped for Pittsburgh. My father took a, a banking job there, and, and that was that. But many friends remained here for many years, and I've come back from time to time. And I, I must say I have very fond memories of the town and, and um, growing up in what was a classical suburban childhood, um, taking music lessons. I played the violin for many years, um, having a paper route on the north side, um, having a, be, being part of the scout troop, um, 
participating in the orchestra um, and, and choir in Westfield High, um, being a member proudly of the, uh, of the track team that brought Walt Clarkson his first state championship yeah. <clears throat> in 1969. And then I went on to Middlebury College. Now, at that point, uh, I did think I was going to continue a career in music. Um, I was fairly accomplished as a violinist. Um, and I played music for my first few years at Middlebury. Uh, but then, and I was expected to go on in the field. Um, but then I pivoted rather abruptly <clears throat> in my sophomore year for reasons that I still can't quite explain. I began to focus on the visual arts. Um, and it's still pretty much of a mystery to me, but I suspect that it had to do <clears throat> with an aptitude for visual and spatial thinking. <clears throat> my first love, in, in fact, happened to be architecture. We only come rec more recently to recognize different kinds of intelligences, intelligences and learning styles. And certainly I found out um, long after the fact that I did have an aptitude for looking at things and making sense of them visually and spatially. And so art history um, became a new and up until then an unexplored interest, first at Middlebury and then in, at graduate school, um, in graduate school at New York University. So I came back down to New York um, and used the city with its many museums um, as an unparalleled laboratory for, the, for study in this field. And this was in the late 1970s and early 1980s. Now, um, as you can imagine, a question I was constantly asked in those years was what could one do with a degree in art history? <laughs> You may recall President Obama saying the same thing, what do you do with a degree in art history? Um, and again, everyone, save for my blessed mother, asked me that. So having completed my graduate coursework in the early 1980s, I was forced at long last to really think about a career. Getting a job teaching at that time when the humanities were first in retreat, and that has remained the case for the past several decades, um, and mandatory retirement in higher education had been abolished. <coughs> and therefore, the supply of, of teaching positions dried up, because people stayed in them, meant that it was going to be a very difficult challenge to find a career teaching art history. I could have done that, um, but at that point, my wife, as she often does, intervened in my decision making. <laughs> and she said, she said one day we sat down, she said, tell me about what you do next if you want to be a teacher. And I said, well, you, you cast about and you get uh, one or two or three year appointments in various places and uh, eventually you, uh, you, you w might latch on to a tenure track job and then you have to wait seven years and you're up for tenure, and if you're approved, you, you have a job. <laughs> she looked at me and she said, quite frankly, if you think I'm going to follow you around the country while you, you do that, you've got another thing coming. <laughs> so it was my good fortune um, at that time to have taken several courses in museum studies, um, then a field still in its infancy. One of these involved the development and installation of an exhibition of prints uh, at the Metropolitan <coughs> Museum of Art. I, I was so enamored with this work, and I believe pretty good at it, that I sought and gained an internship at the Cooper Hewitt Museum. Here you see it's, it's building um, on East 91st Street in New York. It's the former uh, mansion of Ar Andrew Carnegie. And it is the um, Smithsonian's National Museum of Design. And I received an internship, offered to spend a, a year as an intern in the Department of Drawings and Prints there. Um, and I, little did I know at that time that what had started out then as a curiosity about museums and their work and a, and a nascent interest in them would evolve into a career in a field that's, that spanned four decades and more than 30 years as a director of four institutions. <clears throat> and little did I know that my entry into the field at that point, again, 1983, 
would coincide with an unprecedented period of growth in art museums, not only in, not only in this country, but indeed around the world. So in other words, um, it was a bit of serendipity too. I got lucky uh, in my choice of vocation. It was something I loved then and I still love today. And there were also opportunities that unfolded over time that at that moment in the early 1980s, I could never have imagined. So then and, as now, and now, museums offered for me, to me, the opportunity to explore the source materials for art history, that is the nature and purpose and meaning of original works of art. <coughs> now that may seem to you an, an obvious point, um, but it really isn't, and I think it's something that um, more art historians should should pay heed to that um, one's understanding of, of the history of art, of the work of artists, what they intend to do with the individual work of art, begins with close looking, examination of the original work of art. And what that can yield is really quite extraordinary. Um, and it's a renewable resource. You can go back to a work of art again and again, just as you can go back to a great poem, a great novel, um, and learn more from it looking at it, at it from different perspectives, uh, but also looking at it um, through the, the lens of your own experience and what you've learned over time. So the Cooper Hewitt, again, what you see here, where I worked as a curator for nearly four years, provided me, as it did for most directors, um, an introduction to the field in which they were interested in. <clears throat> that is the development and care of collections, the creation of exhibitions and public programs, and the possibilities of interpreting works of art from a variety of, of different perspectives, stylistic, biographical, and contextual, <clears throat> to name just a few. assistant director of the Hood Museum of Art, which you see on the screen here, in 1987, and then director in 1991, enabled me to learn about museum administration, about strategic planning, budgeting, fundraising, collections management and display, conservation, program development, and how to align the functions of a college museum with those of the parent institution. How do you add value to undergraduate education? How do you make the experience of learning um, at Dartmouth, um, even more unique and valuable to undergraduates and faculty. Apart from these, um, my experience at Dartmouth taught me a more fundamental lesson about the importance of stewardship, about valuing the history of the museum, about understanding its collection and how this might be utilized for the benefit of students and faculty and our public visitors, and about the importance of being ambitious on behalf of the institution by working to increase its resources. Building an imaginative schedule of exhibitions and academic programs, and most significantly, continuing to expand and strengthen its collection. All of this in service of leaving the museum stronger than I found it. Dartmouth's collection is nearly as old as the college itself, which was founded in 1769, and includes um, everything from antiquities, uh, like this great Athenium amphora from the early 5th century uh, before Christ, to contemporary art. Not surprisingly, it contains many objects related to the college and its own history, such as this charming 1831 portrait of one of its graduates, George Tickner, by the American painter Thomas Sully. Or this wonderful landscape <clears throat> by Maxfield Parrish, the celebrated American illustrator who spent most of his life in the New Hampshire town of Plainfield, not far from Dartmouth, where my wife and I live today. <clears throat> now, I'll return to the question of caring for and developing collections later in this talk, but first let me continue this narrative in the form of a travelogue. After leaving Dartmouth, I worked in three public museums, successively in Cincinnati, Cleveland, and finally in Philadelphia, each one substantially larger and more complex than the one before. Um, here I show you a view 
of the Cincinnati Art Museum um, dating to, to 1938, just before the Second World War, um, and well before they, uh, they put another addition on the building that, that absolutely destroyed its character. So I think it's, this is a better view. <laughs> now, these three, again, Cincinnati, Cleveland, and Philadelphia, were all also relatively old museums. Cleveland having been founded in, in 1913, funded by the new fortunes that had been created uh, there around the turn of the 20th century. Cincinnati is even older. It's an older town. Uh, founded in 1881. Um, the first of its buildings opened in 1886. <clears throat> and then Philadelphia, one of this nation's oldest and largest public museums, founded in 1876 uh, on the occasion of the centennial of the founding of this country. In each case, what I inherited <clears throat> was a prominent public institution with a very significant history in the field, as well as distingu a distinguished collection. Their buildings were, in the truest sense of this phrase, civic monuments. And they house sizable collections. In the case of Cleveland, about 45,000 works of art. In Cincinnati, about 60,000 and in Philadelphia, nearly 250,000, which are world-renowned and the basis for their reputations in the world of art. Cincinnati's collection, I'll start with a, the first museum where I served uh, from 2000 to 2006, is truly encyclopedic, <coughs> ranging in scope from, from antiquities, from Greece, Rome, Egypt, and the ancient Near East. <clears throat> Here in a Syrian statuette, carved in ivory from the 8th century BC and, and acquired by the museum in the 1950s, to a wonderful collection of Native American art. Here a truly remarkable object, a mask, a mask fashioned from a conch shell, um, found in Tennessee and dating to between 1000 and 1500 AD, as well as, as great collections or holdings of European and American art. And I'll just show you one example from those collections, um, here represented by an 1886 painting by the French Impressionist Claude Monet, <clears throat> depicting the rock formations on an island called Belle Isle off the coast of Brittany. Moving to, to Cleveland in 2007, I assumed leadership of a museum with a staff of 300, a $35 million annual operating budget, an, an endowment of close to $500 million, as well as a massive renovation project that would nearly double the size of the museum and take nearly 10 years to complete. This is a view of the museum's first building in the background there, <clears throat> which opened to the public in, in 1916, seen here across the landscape designed as a setting by the firm founded by Frederick Law Olmsted. Again, um, just to remind you, um, this, like Cincinnati, is a great civic monument within the city of Cleveland. This building, um, which still exists, would be expanded in the mid-1950s, again in the early 1970s, and more recently, uh, as I mentioned, just a decade ago. Its collection, although not large, again, about 45,000 objects, is comprehensive in scope. Um, the retired director of the, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Philippe de Montebello, um, once called it, um, with a mixture of admiration and condesc condescension, um, an executive summary of the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. <laughs> in other words, it covered the same territory geographically, artistically, stylistically, and qualitatively, but with 45,000 objects rather than the three million that the Met has. <laughs> but what a collection. Here, uh, ju I'll just show you a few examples uh, from Cleveland, uh, the collection of which I miss very much. Um, this is a great piece of medieval art dating to about 1190. It's a piece of Limoges enamel um, called the Spitzer Cross um, after one of its owners um, in the 19th century. Um, and it stands in for uh, Cleveland's great holdings of ancient um, and medieval art. And this is widely considered to be one of the finest examples of Limoges enamel to be found anywhere in the world. <clears throat> and now on the screen, one of the great 
showstoppers in Cleveland's collection. This marvelous terrine in silver, a masterwork of Rococo design, uh, and a work of art that was intended quite literally to stop you uh, in the tracks um, uh, as a centerpiece on a grand table set to impress. Um, it dates to 1737 by a French designer named Juste Aurel Maisonnier. Um, and to my eye, it's the most remarkable piece of, of silver craftsmanship I have ever seen. Or to um, switch gears once again, a work that many consider to be one of the greatest of American paintings, Frederick Edwin Church's Twilight in the Wilderness, an image intended to evoke the beauty and grandeur of the unspoiled American landscape that, that was the subject of so many Hudson River School landscape painters. Um, this picture completed in 1860 on the very eve of the Civil War, a fact that lends to it an elegiac and even haunting quality considering what was to come over the next five years. And on to Philadelphia. <clears throat> In late 2009, to take on the very big responsibility of directing this institution. Um, and just for comparative purposes, um, there I was responsible for a staff of 500 <laughs> curators, conservators, security guards, educators, um, fundraisers, what have you. <clears throat> uh, an annual operating budget of $65 million, an endowment of about $500 million at, at the time. You might re have recalled that I said Cleveland, which had a much smaller budget, also had an endowment of $5 million, which simply meant that at Philadelphia, we had to raise more money each and every year to keep the doors open um, and the engine stoked. Um, this. Philadelphia is, as I mentioned earlier, one of the, this country's oldest public art museums and indisputably one of its finest. And I was just mentioning to one of my colleagues here that if that isn't part of your museum past program, uh, shame on you. <laughs> it should be. <clears throat> um, here, the second of the museum's two homes, um, this grand structure completed in 1928 um, after a full decade worth of construction. And I'll show you two pictures of this building <clears throat> for, for, for several reasons. One, first it is, is to demonstrate that of the three public museums I've just shown you, Philadelphia's is, is the most demonstrably a civic monument, both by virtue of its size. That building uh, encompasses some 600,000 square feet space. Um, and because of the prominent place it occupies in the topography of, of the city of Philadelphia, located as it is at the western end of the Benjamin Franklin Parkway, for those of you who know the city, that's the great civic thoroughfare which was completed uh, in the very year that this new building opened, 1928. And also at the beginning, and you can see it's um, stretching off in the distance there, um, at the beginnings of Fairmount Park, the largest urban park in this country. So the Philadelphia Museum of Art is truly a great civic monument in that regard. It also has a great collection. And I would argue that that, that too, its collection is after fashion, also a kind of civic monument. Um, representing as it does the accumulated efforts of many generations of Philadelphians who bequeathed their collections to the museum and in doing so, made it a great, the great resource for the city and the country, indeed the world, that it is today. Um, here, for example, is a stained glass roundel from Saint-Chapelle, that great, wonderful Jew box of a Gothic building in the center of Paris dating to the 1240s. So right in the middle of, of, of the high Gothic period. That was acquired by a Philadelphian when he was visiting that city, that is to say Paris, in 1805. And eventually, this made its way into our collection. And here, also in the Philadelphia collection, um, one of the 15th century Netherlandish painter Roger van der Weyden's finest works, a diptych or two panel painting depicting the crucified Christ with the Virgin and St. John the Evangelist, a work of austere beauty and profound emotional power that remains after all these years, my favorite work of art in any collection in this country. This is a gift from the great corporate lawyer, John G. Johnson, 
who upon his death in 1917 bequeathed his entire the collection, collection rather, to the city of Philadelphia and is now um, in the custody of the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Another of Johnson's gifts, and an equally powerful work of art, is this late painting uh, of the Maine coast by the American uh, artist Winslow Homer. It is but one example of the strength of the museum's holding, especially in, in American art, which in turn reflect the pivotal, pivotal role that Philadelphia has played for over, uh, in the development of the arts in this country for over the course uh, of more than two centuries. Now I finish um, this survey, this brief survey of the museums at which I've worked uh, and their collections with this marvelous early self-portrait by Pablo Picasso, also in Philadelphia's collection. Uh, dating to 1906, it shows Picasso on the verge of becoming the artist we know today as having quite literally changed the course of modern art. <clears throat> this was donated to the museum by Walter and Louise Ehrensberg, two collectors, um, then living in, in Los Angeles, who found the promise of their remarkable collection, which reads like a catalog of great modern artists, being shown in the, in the context of the collection of the Philadelphia Museum of Art at the time. And this, this and, the, and her, their collection was donated in 1940 to be completely irresistible. Believe me when I say, I'm glad that they did. <laughs> now, let me return to um, my former colleague at the Met, Philippe de Montebello, um, now retired as I am. Um, and note that he once famously said that the Met would still be a great museum, even if it's closed its doors and never opened them again to the public. Now, he knew this would annoy many people. <laughs> After all, what, what is a museum without people to interact with the works of art? Um, but he did so anyway to underscore what for him was an article of faith, that it is a collection that makes a museum great and should be the focus of the museum's work in all of its different facets. To be sure, you can't truly activate a collection, make it come to life, unless you are thinking first, last, and always about audiences. But over time, as I guess I've become a little more old-fashioned and conservative too, I've come to agree with Philippe that it is the collection that should always be foremost in the mind and the heart of a museum director. To use once again a word that I've cited before, I believe this is indeed the essence of good and thoughtful stewardship. Now, caring for and utilizing the collection in a way that is both thoughtful and creative is, is also a remarkably interesting as well, it, it, task, as well as complex in its various aspects. Um, and I've grown over time to realize how complex uh, it, it is and how many dimensions it has and also what kind of creativity you have to bring to that proposition or that question? How do you activate a collection, make it come to life, utilize it in all of its aspects, ta and take good care of it? Again, the essence of good stewardship. It requires us, for example, to conserve the works of art in our care with all that that entails. Uh, in the case of the 30-foot-long mural by um, that Joan Miro, the great Spanish artist, was commissioned in 1947 to paint for the Terrace Garden Hotel in Cincinnati. Um, it required our conservation staff not only to clean the mural, which had been transferred to the museum in the mid-1960s, so it was in our collection, but also to remove it, quite literally inch by inch, from the plywood backing to which it had been glued. Replacing this with a much more sympathetic support, a canvas backing, which allowed the painting, again, 30 feet long and about eight feet tall, uh, to be rolled up and moved and restretched without doing any harm to it. Um, here you see that reinstallation in process in 2004. And two years later, we actually rolled this picture up and sent it to um, Washington, D.C. and Switzerland for an exhibition on Miro's work and did so quite safely. 
conservation also can help us understand both the artist's intentions and working process, as well as the changes that often occur to works of art after the fact. In the case of Philadelphia painter Thomas Aiken's masterpiece, The Gross Clinic, which you see in the background here, in Philadelphia's painting conservation studio, collaborative research between our curators and conservators revealed that earlier cleanings of the work, going back to the 1920s, had in fact stripped the surface of its delicate oil glazes um, and the subtle interplay between light and shade that had so animated the surface of this painting had in fact been lost. A careful research project followed by an equally careful conservation treatment. You see it here in process. I should underscore for you that every conservation treatment today is also reversible. So if, if new information comes to light in the future, if a mistake was made, it can be, it can be canceled or, or removed without damaging the painting below. So careful conservation treatment, you see it here in process, reversed these damages and brought this great work once again back to life. Um, by the way, I'm going to be talking about acquisitions a bit later and the commitment that donors, either through giving their collections or funding acquisitions, purchases, um, have made to the development of these great collections. It's truly a partnership between curators, directors, and donors. Um, this is a perfect example of that because this painting was for decades in the collection of of Thomas Jefferson University. Samuel Gross, the, the subject of the painting, was one of its greatest faculty members and a world-renowned surgeon. Um, well, in their wisdom, they decided to sell the painting. And we're about to pack it off to um, Sotheby's for auction um, in 2005, 2005, 2006. That prompted Philadelphia, led by the Philadelphia Museum of Art, to um, raise $75 million to keep this painting in the city. And it's now shared um, between the Philadelphia Museum of Art and the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. So an example of, of intra-institutional -inst um, collaboration as well. Likewise, um, a similar collaboration between conservator and curator brought back to life a pioneering suite of painted neoclassical furniture uh, designed by the architect Benjamin Latrobe for a thoroughly modern and stylish new house built in Philadelphia in 1808. Until this study took place, and here you see one of the, the chairs from that house, uh, we knew very little about this furniture and how innovative it was when it was made in the first decade of the 19th century. My job was to recognize the importance of the work of our, our staff was doing on this project, give it time to gestate in the event this research and conservation project took five years. Um, and then make sure that the results of this work, research and conservation, uh, was shared with the public in the form of a publication, an exhibition, and a symposium. Now, further, the stewardship of a collection also requires a commitment to research and to sharing this information with the public through publications, both in print and more recently in digital form. Few museums that today do this work comprehensively because it is both time consuming and expensive. But our large public museums, of which Philadelphia is one, continue to carry this torch and to play a vitally important role in disseminating knowledge about the works of art and their care. <clears throat> now, this can take the form of exhibition catalogs, um, like the one you see on the left here, which made use of a great collection of Mexican modern art in the holdings of the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Uh, handbooks of the collection, uh, like the one you see uh, in the center, graced, uh, it's covered graced with um, Marcel Duchamp's most famous painting, um, New Descending a Staircase, and public publications focused on areas in which the museum's holdings are particularly strong, like the art of China, which you see on the right. Also, um, it helps you focus on areas of great importance in the collection that need to be known by a wider audience. So I show you here three additional publications that highlight the importance of Philadelphia's collection of American silver, American furniture, and the work of the Peel family. Charles Wilson Peel, um, his brothers, his sons and daughters, his grandsons. 
Uh, such publications bring to light many works of art that, that are seen only infrequently in the museum's galleries and provide scholars and enthusiasts living far away from Philadelphia with the opportunity to experience the breadth and depth of our collection, even if they have never visited the museum itself. Uh, and if you ask why this work uh, wasn't done before, it again, it costs time and money, and you have to very purposely dedicate yourself and the institution to supporting the kind of research um, and scholarship that will yield these publications, all of which were published uh, during my tenure, so during the last 10 years, to spread the information, knowledge of the, the, the collection far and wide. Uh, it enhances the reputation, but more importantly, it shares with the world a great resource that, uh, that before was simply known by very few people who had visited the museum, gone into our storage rooms. Perhaps the most important, and certainly the most complex, uh, in terms of the different dimensions, uh, the commi uh, commitment we make to our collections, is their presentation in the museum's galleries. Now, although a museum's special exhibitions program um, seemed, seems to grab the attention of the public most often, it is, in fact, the galleries in which our permanent collections are displayed that matter most and can have the greatest impact on how the museum is perceived and utilized by its visitors. To illustrate this with one simple fact, over 90% of the galleries in Cincinnati, Cleveland, and Philadelphia are devoted to the display of their collections. Even so, and rather ironically, such collections were infrequently reinstalled, reinterpreted, or in a word, reimagined. Why? Because this takes time. It takes significant resources, usually go to special exhibitions, and also takes a commitment to changing something that has often been place, in, in place for a very long time. Yet, in recent years, we've seen comprehensive gallery reinstallations done for more, far more frequently than they have been in the past. On the screen here, you see a schematic view of the Cincinnati Art Museum, kind of cutaway that shows you the interior, um, with the area in yellow representing approximately 15,000 square feet of gallery space that was completely renovated in 2003 and reinstalled with the museum's rich holdings of art made by Cincinnati artists in the 19th and 20th centuries. The results were transformative, not simply in how uh, we were able to take advantage of an underutilized part of the collection, but also in terms of the museum's relationship with the city, precisely because we were sharing and celebrating for the very first time a unique aspect of Cincinnati's cultural history. Field of dreams, you build it and they will come, and indeed they did and took pride in what they saw in the museum. Over the next several years in, in Cincinnati, we, re, we, we renewed and reinstalled about 60% of the galleries devoted to the permanent collection, including, as you see here, our galleries of American art. And no one complained about the considerable amount of work this required. Why? Because the staff, our staff and trustees had seen how effective taking such a step could be and how it could transform our relationship with the public. Sometimes, as, as was the case with the Cleveland Museum of Art, renovation and expansion projects are predicated almost entirely on the goal of representing the collection. Here you see a view of the original building to the right and one of the several new wings uh, designed by our project architect, Rafael Pignoli, and built uh, over the last decade. The renovation of the museum's original building modernized a facility um, that had fallen into disrepair and required a complete makeover of its interior, providing new space for Cleveland's great collections of European American art and transforming outmoded interiors like the garden court you see here into galleries that served a new purpose. Uh, in this case, the display of Baroque um, painting and sculpture, uh, but at the same time retain the character and scale of the original spaces. Well, Raphael Vignoli's new wings provided uh, much needed new galleries that were scaled and lit in ways that at long last allowed us to show Cleveland's holdings of modern 
and contemporary art to good advantage. And here you see one of those new galleries with um, uh, Monet's water, one of, one of Monet's water lilies in the foreground. Now, why are such projects done, undertaken so infrequently? For one, they are enormously costly, often requiring, ma requiring major upgrades to building and security systems, um, uh, major conservation efforts, new casework, lighting, and many other tasks. Yet the alternative is simply not acceptable. As an example, our galleries of South Asian art, which were renovated, this is in Philadelphia, which were renovated and reopened in 2016, had not had a comprehensive makeover for nearly 50 years before that date. There were many reasons for this, but none of them considered individually or collectively were persuasive. If galleries are brought back to life again, as indeed we found out with our gallery, with our collection of South Asian art, the public will respond. If not, then they will see neglect and a lack of imagination for what they are. Three years prior, let's say in 20, sorry, 2013, we did the same with the Rodin Museum, a separate facility and collection which we manage and operate. Uh, this museum, a lovely jewel box of a building, designed by the accomplished Philadelphia architect, Paul Cray, was renovated inside and out with a new garden design. Here you can see it after the fact. And the, the interiors, here the main gallery, were restored to their original 1920s finishes, new lighting installed, and a substantial number of works of art in the collection conserved, and then a new interpretive plan introduced. The result, attendance doubled in the first year and settled down to a 50% increase annually over previous visitation levels. And best of all, it was something that looked cared for and of which we all could be proud. This work represented good stewardship um, and a commitment to the collection that should and will be sustained. Caring also means sharing. Cincinnati, Cleveland, and most of all Philadelphia continually receive, receive requests for loans from their collections to other institutions. Given the challenges of cost, condition, and inherent fr fragility, it's not always possible to accede to, to loan requests. But I and, and many of my colleagues believe that we have an obligation, civic per and perhaps even moral, to lend as often and as generously as we can, even if that means going the extra mile. Here you see the removal of a painting by the American post-war painter Cy Twombly uh, from our galleries in Philadelphia, one of a series of canvases collectively titled 50 Days at Ilium and dating to 1978. After this work had been acquired by the museum in the 1980s and, and installed in our galleries, <clears throat> it had never been lent to another institution. That is, until the Centre Pompidou came calling and asked us um, if we could share this for a great retrospective of paintings in Paris of the artist's work. At first, our staff said no. Largely because the largest of the canvases could not fit through the gallery doors. <laughs> How did they get in in the first place, I asked. <laughs> the answer, as you can see in this slide, was to remove the stone frames from the doors to the gallery and tilt the painting. As you can see, it just squeaked by, right? But it was well worth the effort. Here you see uh, a part of the, several of the paintings installed in a gallery at the Centre Pompidou in Paris, where the series was the centerpiece of the exhibition. It made me proud. Sometimes collection sharing also means sending exhibitions of the kind of art that rarely that are rarely seen in other parts of the world, working with partner institutions. Such was the motivation behind the decision in 2016 to organize a survey uh, entitled Art Across America and to send it to several venues on quite literally the other side of the world, first in Seoul in South Korea and later in Sydney. Here you see the entrance to the Art Gallery of New South Wales in Sydney touting the opening of the exhibition. We also organized and toured a survey of the life and art of Marcel Duchamp. Philadelphia is a wonderful collection of, of works by this seminal figure in the history of modern art, 
also to several venues in the Far East, to Tokyo, Seoul, and Sydney. Why? Because if you ask most contemporary artists in Japan, in Korea, in China, or in Australia, who was the most influential figure in the field of modern contemporary art, they would invariably say Marcel Duchamp. Yet no survey exhibition had ever been mounted in any of these countries. It was long overdue, and it served the purpose of providing young artists with a first-hand exposure to, to Duchamp and his works, and at the same time, increased recognition of the Philadelphia Museum of Art across the world. Now, sharing can also be done digitally, and indeed, this is the shape of things to come. Most museums now publish objects in their collections online, often with useful resources such as bibliographies and exhibition histories, but much more is possible. At the Philadelphia Museum of Art, for example, with the support of the National Endowment for the Humanities, we formed a consortium of several institutions with extensive collections and archival holdings uh, related to Marcel Duchamp. To be sure, we could have done so separately and independently, but this was best done together because now one can search, uh, one search will identify and organize objects and related data from all three institutions and make a wealth of information available to researchers around the world with just a few keystrokes. Of course, we hope that scholars will still visit uh, and study Duchamp's work and his archives on site in Philadelphia. But it's also wonderful, and again, the shape of things to come, to be able to share this information in new ways with scholars to whom it was previously inaccessible. Now, I'm going to end because we're running out of time, with, um, with a, a very quick whistle-stop tour uh, to illustrate the last point I want to make about stewardship. And that is uh, among the many ways you can define stewardship, and I've just covered a couple, conservation, uh, publications, research, scholarship, and so on, sharing collections. Uh, the most important one for a, a director is the continued development of the collection he or she has inherited um, and is responsible for. Uh, this is a large and, and complex task. It's also a task that takes time and takes patience. Um, but I can't underscore how important it is. Museums like the ones I've, I've been uh, covering in this talk are, are known by their, for their collections. Um, and they will be known by their collections in the future only if they continue to develop those collections strengthen them, deepen them, enrich them, make them even more valuable and powerful resources for the public, for scholarship, and the like. So this is something that, that I took very seriously and worked hard at um, and gave a lot of uh, thought to um, in each of the posts I have had over the last 30 years, beginning with Dartmouth College. And I'm going to go through these very quickly just to make a few points about uh, what one considers in, in terms of acquisitions. Um, this is a painting by the American Impressionist Willard Metcalf called The First Thaw, dating to uh, 1913. We acquired it for the Dartmouth collection um, in the early 1990s. And the reason we did so primarily was that we didn't have a wonderful example of American Impressionism. And Metcalf was one of the leading figures of the moment. Um, but what made this so interesting to us was that Metcalf, among all the American Impressionists, worked in and around the area um, where Dartmouth is. So for, for several summers and winters, he went up to Vermont, he went up to New Hampshire, in fact, to, to the town in which I live, Plainfield, New Hampshire. And this is a scene from just 20 miles away from Dartmouth. So it, it, it adds to our, our collection of regional art as well as fills a gap in the collection. I typically have favored um, building on existing collections but sometimes time and circumstance um, give you an opportunity that you just can't pass up. And one such opportunity was the gift of nearly 1,000 works of Melanesian art from Papua New Guinea, Irian Jaya, the other half of that island, uh, Vanuatu, um, that came to the museum uh, from a single collector in Los Angeles um, in the late 1990s and single, in one stroke, put the museum on the map as one of the leading collections of this type of art in the world. Um, I believe it's a collection that will 
turn out to be an invaluable teaching and, and research resource for Dartmouth in the future. And it's going to start and end with this collection in the, Philadelphia, in, in the, in the Hood Museum of Art. Sometimes uh, you want to trade up. You, find, uh, you want a better work of art than one by the same artist that you had in your collection. Such was the case with this picture um, that I saw at Herschel and Adler um, in New York um, in about 2002. It's a painting of uh, the Yosemite Valley, with Brian Blales Falls in the distance, um, and the meadows in the foreground. Um, a kind of sketch done on site uh, by the great uh, Hudson River School painter, Albert Biershock. Uh, I've never found a fresher, more beautiful image of, of Yosemite uh, than this. Um, and it also filled a gap in our collection in Cincinnati in that it was um, a picture made in the West at a time when artists were first going out West uh, and beginning to record the extraordinary landscapes uh, that they found there. Cincinnati also has a wonderful collection of Impressionist art. Not a big one, but all the major figures are represented. Uh, Degas, Manet, Monet, uh, Frederick Basile, and others. What we didn't have was a painting by Renoir. Uh, and we, we set out to go hunting for this. I remember vividly a, a conversation that I had with our curator of a, a European art. And um, I said, we need a Renoir. It was fashionable at that time for, for curators and academics to turn their nose up at Renoir. Um, and she did, she did just that. And I said, I said don't sell him short. Um, he, he's a marvelous painter, uh, particularly at certain points in his career. I think the, his landscapes from the early 1880s are his, among his finest and most adventurous. We found this picture in New York. Um, I asked her to go look at it. She came back. She said, he's pretty good. <laughs> and so this picture, um, a view of uh, of fog lifting in the morning uh, on the coast of the Isle of Guernsey now graces the collection of the Cincinnati Art Museum. And it was acquired at a time when we could afford to buy a Renoir. <laughs> Cleve the Cleveland Museum of Arts collection is strong, as I mentioned, in many different areas, uh, one of which is, is Asian art, and particularly its, its holdings of, of sculpture and and painting from the Indian subcontinent. It has a marvelous collection of bronzes, but it didn't ever have a, a truly fine, large-scale, monumental temple sculpture um, that could serve as a kind of centerpiece for that collection. So we acquired this for, for Cleveland in 2007. Uh, it was purchased at auction, um, and it set a world record price for um, for sculpture of this type, uh, $5.2 million, if you're curious. Um, and I said at the time I thought it was a bargain. Um, and I feel even more so today. It was also an act of reclamation, because it was actually um, deaccessioned, that is, it was dis disposed of for sale by another museum. In this case, the Albright Knox Museum in Buffalo, which, which um, which sold a lot of works of art that weren't modern or contemporary in order to focus on those two fields. Um, so I called the director up. We bid anonymously. I called the director up and I said, I want to let you in on a secret. Um, this sculpture, a great temple sculpture from South India uh, of the figure of Brahma, is not leaving the shores of Lake Erie. It's just going to be shown in another museum, <laughs> Cleveland. And lastly, um, I know I'm running out of time, uh, just a few examples of, uh, of collections development and the reasons for that uh, from Philadelphia. Um, th this is a picture, uh, also an act of uh, reclamation, and it was acquired by the museum in 2010. It's a portrait by Charles Wilson Peel of a, of an Af a free African-American slave named Yaro Mamut. He was reputed at that time to be 140 years old. Um, so an example of longevity and clean living. It was um, painted <laughs> by Charles, Charles Wilson Peel, the great Philadelphia painter, um, and included in his first museum um, installation. Uh, in 2010, it was being sold by the Philadelphia History Museum, and we decided that a picture of this type, an African-American subject dating to 1819, 
should not leave Philadelphia. And so we acquired it. And it's now proudly in the collection of the Philadelphia Museum of Art. This is a, um, a pair, a high chest of drawers on the left and a dressing table on the right by the same hand, um, dating to the middle of the 1760s. It's uh, based on the, pa the carved panel in the front of, in each piece. It's called the Fox and Grapes High Boy and Dressing Table because the, the panel illustrates uh, um, the, the, the Aesop's fable uh, of that title. The museum had long had the tall the high chest of drawers, but the dressing table remained in the collection of a dealer. And finally, we persuaded him to sell it. <laughs> Came to the museum at a very high price, but well worth it because um, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And secondly, there are only three such pairs of, of this kind of work in this country, and this is without doubt, by far and away, the finest. Really quite extraordinary. This is a, a, another rare thing acquired in 2009, um, a man and horse armor. The horse armor, by the way, being far rarer than the armor for the, the rider. Um, this was acquired by the museum for its great collection of arms and armor. Um, and I'll say two things about it, and then, um, then I will yield the podium back to Barbara. One is that um, this could not have been acquired without a substantial amount of donations, number of donations from donors in Philadelphia. And that is often the case with great works of art that museums acquire today. Um, they can't buy them out of their endowments. Um, the prices are too high. Uh, we had to go time and again to donors, uh, hat in hand, and say, would you help? And happily, that happened time and again. So this public-private partnership between donors and collectors, the museums, is robust and still, um, still works today. And it is part of the genius of the American system. The second thing I'll say about this is, is again, one of only a small number of these combinations, man and horse armor, is to be found anywhere in this country. I believe there are six in total. The last one was auction, went to auction in 19, the 1950s. And the donor of Philadelphia's collection of arms and armor, a man named Keenbush, bid on it, but he was the underbidder. And in his notebook, he, he had a picture of this from the newspaper. And under it, he wrote, the fish that got away. <laughs> the successful bidder, by the way, was William Randolph Hearst. <laughs> When we introduced this piece in Philadelphia in 2009, I said to the assembled, I told the same story and said to the assembled group, now we can say, 50 years after the fact, that we finally reeled that fish in. <laughs> and it's become a very proud part of our collection. And lastly, just to make, uh, again, a point I've made, underscore a point I've made before, the vast majority of works of art that come into our collections. This is, this is a picture that came as a gift to Philadelphia uh, about six years ago. The vast majority of, of objects that come into the collection come by gift, over 95%. So the relationship between a museum and its community or communities, the, the willingness and the ability, the success of a museum to work with donors, to persuade them to give their collections to museums or to help acquire work of art by purchase still is the key to the development of collections. Now, this is a, this is a painting, a beautiful painting, by Claude Monet dating to the early 1880s. Um, the, uh, Ilo, uh, I, the Isle of Saint Martin in the, in the Seine um, that uh, filled in a gap in our collection, um, <coughs> in a collection that's really quite strong in works by Monet. Um, we have, by the last count, about 16 paintings by Monet in Philadelphia. Uh, you might ask, do we really need another one? My answer is emphatically, yes. Um, and that is, that is what makes the genius of these great collections. They're deep, they're rich, and they're evolving always towards something even deeper and richer and more wonderful. And I think it augurs well for the future. So with that, I'm going to stop, because I've spoken far too long. <laughs>
take the floor first to just say Lauren Barr is talking in September, I think, October. Uh, she's our third speaker, so uh, come here about the Westfield Leader. The other thing, and I'm going to be really selfish and just say, Timothy, I now want to go to every museum <laughs> I have <laughs> been at again. Because what you taught us tonight, I'm like, I have chills. Yeah. It was mind blowing. this one on the screen, and um, it's about challenges and, and opportunities. Um, uh, these things represent both. Um, they're, they're issues that we need to understand and deal with um, and address creatively. Um, I've spoken already about understanding and honoring the past. These great old institutions have deep and rich histories, and, and in order to do right by them in the future, we have to understand and build upon those foundations. Um, Changing audiences, like, likewise, is something that I could have given this talk on and focused entirely on that because it's really a, an important key. Audiences are changing. Um, where they come from, what they know, what their cultural norms are, are, are ever more diverse, and museums need to be responsive to that in terms of how they welcome them into their buildings, how they engage them with exhibitions and programs, how they interpret their collections for people whose experience of the world may be very different than ours. But to come to your question, the last two points made here, I think, really are intended to address the digital divide, the threshold we've, in some ways, already have reached, but so much still lies beyond. I often said to our staff that um, I woke up every morning um, blessing and cursing the day, the, the digital revolution, because it was changing so very much in our, in our museums. Do I think it's going to denature or devalue the experience of original works of art? Absolutely not. No more than a postcard of the, the Eiffel Tower uh, diminishes your desire to go to Paris and see the thing itself. Sharing information about the collections digitally, whether they're digital images or interpretation around an object, uh, first of all, allows a museum to get to reach beyond its own four walls and reach out to a much broader audience, indeed one that is potentially global. When you think of the multiplier effect, digital is really an incredibly important tool. But secondly, it allows us to share information and to tailor information for different audiences, different learning styles and the like. I think we're just at the beginning of this, and I think there are great, great times that lie ahead for museums and so on. Now, one of the challenges I think that, that uh, I'm really curious about how this is going to play out is that the digital revolution also is a revolution in image making, such as we haven't seen since the, the beginning of the Renaissance, the invention of the printing press, perhaps the, the invention of photography in, in the 1830s. But what happens now, what will art look like in the future is an open question, more so than it's ever been before. I think great things lie ahead. Artists always figure out a way to use new technologies, to do, do, do new and, and very interesting and meaningful things. But also it's going to have a corollary effect. Who grows up now with an oil painting or an etching or sculpture in their household? Um, I grew up with them um, on the walls of our house. But Young people today are, are entering a world in which the things I showed you, oil paintings, prints, drawings, 
sculpture are going to take on a more artifactual nature. They're not going to be necessarily a part of their world, as they were for, for many of you and for me and for people who lived before us. Um, so how museums look and feel and act, what they show, and how we negotiate the relationship between past and present is going to be really interesting. Now, one last point. And for this reason, I am very glad that I've retired. <laughs> People are saying that AI will change everything. I haven't paid much attention to this, to those prognostications, until quite recently. But I've come to realize that um, AI is going to change museums fundamentally as, as well. I think it has the capacity, the potential to be an enormously powerful tool for learning, for tailoring interpretation, for de delivering information to everyone at, um, at, at, at a word. AI, show me this. Show me all the paintings by Monet from this year so I can compare them to this painting on the wall of the museum. AI, tell me a bit about uh, Monet's life between 1881 and 1883. Um, and that's just... Those are rather banal examples. That's just the tip of the iceberg. I think AI is going to be an extraordinary resource for, for learning, but also for putting uh, the power of learning into the hands of our visitors in ways that we could never do before. And it can be tailored to the, the experience of each and every individual. When you think of that, think how remarkable that is. Uh, I, again, I think there's a really bright future for museums, but you have to be willing to embrace that future. Sometimes it's pretty scary, too. Thanks. We have, uh, we have probably more questions than we have time. I don't even know if this is working. But oh, I, I can, I'm a teacher. I can talk about it. Okay, <laughs> good. <laughs> I've always been curious about the choice of like these statement colors, very bold colors of paint on the walls of a gallery. You would think it's counterintuitive, like it would um, distract you from the paintings themselves. But is there any? Like logic behind the choices of colors on the walls of a gallery? <laughs> I'd like to think there was. But <laughs> uh, uh, let me first say that um, all this is a matter of fashion. That fashion ebbs and flows. Um, for years and years and years, the, the standard in museums was the white box, right? Um, simple room, undetailed white color um, on the walls. And you just let the works of art speak for themselves. And the background is neutral. Well, um, that, as you can imagine, was subjected to a very significant critique for a whole lot of, of reasons, one of which it, it never allowed museums to explore contextual displays. Putting a work of art, I think the Cincinnati Wing is an example of that, putting a work of art in, in a space where the colors uh, and the design, in, in that case, we, we had wallpaper, wallpaper from um, the 1870s and 1880s. It gave people a sense of, of the context in which the artists were working. But again, I'm going to come back to fashion and simply say um, some people love bright, bold colors. We do this all the time in exhibitions. Some people like a pale, neutral palette. Um, and the fashion ebbs and flows. And it's a little more than that. Okay. I'm not sure it's working well. Oh, can, can you hear me? No. Yeah. You have to uh, stand up and shout. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, we've been reading a lot in recent years about works of art being repatriated to native tribes, you know, the countries where they originated. Can you give um, uh, just a quick like a synopsis on the what are the grounds for repatriating works of art and maybe some examples from your career? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it, it's a large and, and very complex subject to, to cover in a, a brief answer. So I'll simply say that um, if a work of art um, is proven, you, there can be direct uh, evidence, there can be circumstantial evidence and the like, proven to have been uh, uh, looted, that is uh, illegally taken, uh, from its place of origin, whether it's a, an archaeological site or a church or what have you. Um, <clears throat> we are bound um, legally and morally to, to return that work of art. 
it's better off if you don't buy it in the first place. And sometimes you're, you're dealing with, with things that have been acquired long before you arrived on the scene. Um, well, I was thinking particularly the stained glass from Santa Chapelle. Why shouldn't that go back to Santa Chapelle? Well, um, it, it could, but um, the French, <laughs> put it this way, the French moved on a long time ago. And in fact, in 1805, when that object was acquired by the, the traveling Philadelphian, the French were busy disassembling their Gothic monuments, um, sacking many buildings, monasteries, churches, and the like, because France had become secular under Napoleon. And this was a, this was a, uh, these are examples of France's papist past. past. And, um, and so the French really um, vandalized their, their own past. Um, and it got to a point where um, a man named Alexandre Lenoir actually began going around collecting fragments and put them together in a museum, what became a museum in Paris, precisely because he felt that the vandalization of the past was just terrible. So uh, the, French, the French gave this up, in a sense. And um, it was acquired, therefore acquired legally. Should it go be restored to that ensemble? That's an interesting question. But there's no legal claim uh, that the French could make on it. Uh, and if they did, they'd be in a hell of a lot of trouble because half of the Louvre was looted by Napoleon. <laughs> now, let me answer the second part of your question. Say, when, when I was the director of Philadelphia, uh, the Cleveland Museum of Art, which has a collection of, uh, of Greek and Roman antiquities, uh, I was asked by the Italian government to come and talk to them about certain objects in the collection. And we ended up, after long research, uh, repatriating returning 14 objects from Philadelphia, Cleveland's collection to the Italian government. I thought there were grounds for doing that. They've been mostly been acquired long before I arrived on the scene. Um, but I thought they had grounds for it. They asked for 60. If you do the math, um, the others, re they really didn't have a basis for the claim. And I said, just because you want it, you can't have it. You need to be need to provide us with proof. Now, one corollary, uh, and then I'll end, that, end the, the answer. It's better not to tread into those waters unless you're very, very sure. So when I was director in Cleveland, our curator of antiquities came to me and he said, I want us to buy this monument, this colossal head, over life-size head of a Roman emperor. Fant fantastic thing. And I said, okay, what's its history? Where did it come from and the like? And he gave it to me and I said, um, this is not complete. There, there are facts missing. And I said, you need to provide a complete and unassailable provenance history of ownership for this or I'm not gonna do it. Eventually I said, no, he couldn't do it. Well, he waited me out and my successor in Cleveland agreed to buy the piece. I guess they were convinced that the provenance they'd been given was accurate. Well, fast forward 10 years, they published this colossal head proudly. Somebody opened the publication, looked at it and say, that's from a museum in Italy, southern Italy. It was stolen during World War II. And that is now back in Italy. So caveat emptor, let the buyer beware. fascinating talk. Uh, how do you feel about uh, dealing with donors and some of the uh, weight they put on their donations? And I'll use as an example, uh, Isabella Stewart Gardner, with everything has to stay exactly, or I'll use the barns, the barns in Philadelphia. I mean, how, how do you feel about uh, what might be unreasonable requirements for, for a donation? <laughs> I did a tally when I retired of the funds that I had raised Dartmouth to Philadelphia, largely from private 
sources. Uh, that number approached a billion dollars. The collections that we received as gifts during my tenure as director um, probably added up to about half of that. I think the, the commitment that, again, I talked about this in terms of partnership, the commitment that donors make to institutions like ours give them a place at the table. Um, and and I, I guess I could put it bluntly and say some, certainly some leverage in terms of, of, of the museum listening to and responding to their wishes. Um, I've known very few donors who didn't have, who had unreasonable expectations for their gifts and, um, and what might happen with them. Um, when they had unreasonable expectations, and I, I simply said, would say, we can't agree to that. that is, it's contrary to museum policy, or that would put us in a bind, and it wouldn't be good for the museum uh, and its, its public purposes. But for the most part, my experience has been that, that donors who are proud of their collections want them to be seen, want them to be utilized, and want that to be done, those things done in a way that is consistent with the purpose and policies of the museum. Now, very often, and, and this is certainly true in Philadelphia, this meant that the museum made a term commitment for the display of a collection. So in the case of the Ehrensburg collection, a, a, a truly important private collection of modern art, the museum in 1940 agreed to install the collection in its entirety and show it for a period of 25 years, after which that commitment would sunset. The museum also agreed um, that it would not deaccession anything, sell anything for that period of time. We are free and clear beyond that point, beyond 1965, to do what we want with the Ehrensburg collection. That collection largely remains intact. Why? Because it was so important. But I think that kind of give and take, the negotiation and the reaching of an accommodation that honors the donors but gives the museum the latitude, particularly over time, to use a collection flexibly is really what a director needs, needs to aim for. Again, it doesn't always work, but um, in most cases, um, my experience has been that it does and it benefits both parties. Thank you so much. Thank you. Directly to the parking lot.